So welcome everyone who is uh, attending and uh, maybe afterwards listening to that uh, offline. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Felipe Kalle Cosio uh, from the University of Bonn, uh, giving us a presentation about uh, his work titled Drifting Assemblies for Persistent Memory. And um, I just want to mention that um, this talk will be recorded and so we will publish it later on our YouTube channel. And we just figured out that if for some reason, if you feel uncomfortable asking questions um, during the recording, that we can let us know later and then we can either cut you out or you ask the question there at the absolute end when we stop recording. Just maybe if you, if you have any issue with that, just send us a message in the chat. Um, as a quick introduction, so um, Felipe did his uh, bachelor and master in physics from Hong Kong University and is now a PhD candidate with Hul Martin Mammetheimer. And while we were uh, Googling him a bit, we found out that he has uh, been an active member of the sport climbing club of Hong Kong University and was in the hall of fame. How That's how the, the picture slide was, was uh, mentioned. And um, I don't know the content oh, yeah, of this. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, there was an echo. No, then I'll just continue. Um, that I just want to mention that the work he's presenting is, uh, I assume, at least partly based on um, their current bioarchive article in case you want to read further. And with this, I'm um, giving the floor to Felipe, and I'm very happy and looking forward to the presentation and to the upcoming discussion. So thank you for inviting me. And hello, everyone. This work was done together with Sven Gerdecke, Christian Kloss, and Raoul Lemmersheimer, all are present here, I think. And we were motivated by the following question. How can memories uh, persist over time while the neural representations that underlie these memories change? So here in blue, I show neurons that are currently participating in the neural representation. At some later point in time, typically order of days, some of these neurons may leave and some new neurons may join the neural representation. And at a later time, orders of maybe weeks or months, the neural representation can change quite substantially. And this has been observed in many different brain regions, for example, hippocampus, visual cortex, piriform cortex, um, prelimbic cortex, and in different model organisms. And nothing indicates that memory has changed. So there doesn't seem to be modification of the memory. The drift doesn't seem to affect the memory. Another, and we think a related question is how can memories persist while synapses change, change. And these changes can be activity dependent or can be activity independent. And uh, this has also been observed in many different brain regions. And we think this phenomena are related, but before this, let's mention what other people have proposed as a solution to how can memory be stable despite that representation drifts. One proposal is that there's some stable core to the representation. So some neurons, and here I show them in red, they always participate in the representation. Other neurons can enter or leave, but these neurons are enough for memory to be functional. Another proposal is that there may be multiple states. So here in blue is again, memory representation neurons, and neurons outlined in blue are latent representation neurons. So they don't participate, but they still encode the memory. And at a later time, the latent neurons may start to participate in the representation and the previously active neurons may become latent. Basically, it means there are two equivalent representations, two or more equivalent representations of the same memory in the brain. Another idea is that the drift can be corrected by learning. And here it's easier to think if we put a readout neuron that follows this memory. So readout neuron is active when the memory is recalled 
and to make the connections between the memory representation and the readout neurons, I mean, these connections were learned. And at a later time when representation has changed, the readout neuron would connect to wrong neurons and wouldn't be able to read out the memory. This would lead to errors in a behavior and the same process that learned that helped this readout to learn the representation would also intervene here and either correct the connections or correct the representation. So this requires some feedback when the representation has drifted away and the errors start to appear in the behavior. We were not satisfied with most of this. For example, we want the memory to persist without require, re requiring the behavior to be repeated. Also, there are no definitive observation of some stable core neurons and mul multiple equivalent representations also have some problems um, with experiments. So we have an alternative idea and in our model, as assemblies are the memory representations. So assemblies are groups of tightly connected neurons. And for memories to be viable, an organism needs to be able to recall and act on these memories. So we have some input neurons and output neurons. Output neurons may be like neurons connected to muscles and input neurons can be some early sensory neurons. Our idea is that when a neuron has uh, drifted from this representation, it integrates to this new assembly and that input and output neurons keep track of this change. At, uh, at a period that is quite long, the representation can change completely. So we don't require a stable core. And this should be done without any relearning from repeating the experience. And this assembly is the only representation. So there are no multiple equivalent representations. So this is our idea and that's what we model. And we use leak integrate and fire neurons, two populations, one inhibitory, one excitatory. Only the excitatory synapses are plastic. So between excitatory neurons, every other synapse is uh, static. Inhibition just provides some yeah, global inhibition. The synapses between excitatory neurons are plastic with the following plasticity rule. And we also have homeostatic normalization for the synapses that models the competition between synapses for resources. So the total weight, uh, total input and output weight to the neuron is fixed. Uh, Paul Manns from our group has shown that this may not be necessary and he will talk about this at a Bernstein workshop. We initialize the model with three assemblies. So here I show the weight matrix. The weights are measured in peak EPSP. Here are the indices of the presynaptic neurons and postsynaptic neurons. And for example, the first assembly is made of the first 30 neurons. And you can see that Neuron one connects to all the neurons from one to 30, and so are other neurons, and it has weak connections to the rest of the system. So we have three groups of tightly interconnected neurons that have weak connections to the rest of the system, three assemblies. As I mentioned before, for memory to be viable, it needs to have some readout neurons and input neurons. We also model this. Each assembly has input and output neurons, but I only show the connections to the first assembly for clarity. The autonomous activity of the system looks like this. So this is spiking activity and we just sample some neurons. So this is in black uh, activity of inhibitory neurons. In blue is activity of the three assemblies. So assembly three, two and one and, and Orange and green is the activity of input and output neurons. The first four neurons are the assembly one 
input and output neurons. We have checked that assemblies are functional. So in a, if you strongly activate the input neurons, the assembly will activate and this will activate the output neurons. So the memory can, can work. Now we let our system to evolve according to the plasticity rules. And about half an hour later, we see that the weight matrix has changed. So if we look at uh, this blue bar that has appeared, these are the connections from neuron 64. And previously neuron 64 had connections, strong connections only to assembly three. Now you can see that neuron 64 has weak connections to assembly three, this white bar, and strong connections to assembly one. And there are two other neurons that have switched. So this one and this one. If we now let the system evolve for longer time, so here 30 hours, we see that the weight matrix has completely remodeled and there is no apparent structure anymore. However, what we can do is we can rearrange the indices to see if there is actually structure. And here it's easy to see that there are that there is some structure here. So if we take this neuron 64 and now we move it so it becomes neuron 31, we will see that we will again we'll have this three blocks and we, we do it same for the other neurons that have switched. So we will have three assemblies and assembly one is still connected to the correct input and output neurons. We do the same for this weight matrix. And again, when we recluster it and rearrange the indices, we see that all three assemblies are there and the assembly one connects to the correct input and output neurons. So in effect, we have neurons that switch assemblies and assemblies are always connected to the input and output neurons. So input and output neurons never switch their assembly. To understand why this happens, we first need to understand why assemblies actually stay intact usually. And well, assembly is a group of strongly connected neurons. And for memory, we need this to be stable point, stable fixed point. So if we have some perturbation where I slightly weaken the weight to one of the neurons, we want the assembly to well, heal and go back to the original state. So it needs to strengthen the connection to this neuron. And this happens due to this reactivations because when neurons reactivate, typically most of neurons participate in assembly reactivation. And due to plasticity, all the re reactivated neurons are yeah, increasing their strength to each other. So when assembly reactivates, it removes this perturbation and again, makes the whole all neurons strongly coupled to each other. You can think of assembly as some kind of well, and neurons are balls in this well, and perturbations move these balls around, but they return to the assembly if the assembly is stable. Okay, now let's examine how neurons actually switch the assemblies. For this, we pick a random neuron from our system, we call it the test neuron, and we examine connection from the test neuron and the assembly one, assembly two, and assembly three. So here I plotted uh, how the weights change over time. And the colors of course correspond to this plot. So here you can see that originally the connection between assembly one and test neuron is strong. The connection between test neuron and the other two assemblies is weak. And at this moment, the neuron switches from assembly one and becomes strongly coupled to assembly two and then switches to assembly three and so on. And we want to understand how these transitions happen. So let's zoom in onto this first transition. This is just a zoom in. And I also plot the spikes of the test neuron and the spike in activity of all three assemblies. So assembly one spike in activity, assembly two, assembly three. So you can see initially neuron is coupled to assembly one 
And when assembly one reactivates, neuron typically spikes with it. The test neuron doesn't have to spike only when assembly reactivates, it also spikes spontaneously, for example, here. When other assemblies spike, the test neuron doesn't reactivate because it's not coupled to them. Here, when we see the first large weight change, when neuron starts to couple slightly to assembly two, we see that it reactivated together with assembly two. So neuron has spiked when assembly two reactivated. And this happened just by coincidence. But since they spiked within a short period of time, the plasticity now has increased the connections between test neuron and assembly two. The connections from test neuron to assembly one decreased because of the competition between synapses. Now neuron is, hasn't switched assemblies. It still spikes when assembly one reactivates, for example, here, and it doesn't spike when assembly two reactivates, for example, here. But it's slightly coupled now to assembly two. So if assembly two reactivates, the neuron has a slightly higher than chance level to spike with it. And another big weight change happens again when the neuron spikes when assembly two reactivates, for example, here, and again, here. Now you can see that when assembly two reactivates, neuron starts to spike together with it. So you can think of um, transitions, and the main cause of transitions is that assembly reactivates and neuron just by coincidence spike with it and is pulled to that assembly. There are other smaller contributions, for example, here, when assembly one spikes, but the spike of neuron one is already not so synchronized with it. So the depression kicks in and further reduces the coupling to assembly one. So if we return back to the well picture, we have neurons in assemblies in wells. If you perturb the neuron slightly, it will come back to the well. But if you perturb it strongly, it may move from one well into another. And these strong perturbations in what I've shown you are due to the coincidence spiking of neuron with this assembly. You can look at this plot and actually see well, the well picture here. Neuron in the well is moving around. There are some perturbations, but it returns. But there are some strong perturbations that kick it from one well into another. And yeah, it, it's moving around in this well. The input and output neurons, are, however, must be stable. So they must never leave their well. And that's why they're closer to the bottom. They experience less perturbations. You can see here is the weight to assembly one for its input neuron and the perturbations are much smaller and it never leaves assembly one. And the perturbations are smaller because we made it so. Its plasticity of uh, input and output neurons is just slightly weaker than the plasticity of the assembly neurons. So they never experience enough noise to leave their assembly. And we think that there are other sources of noise. And for example, spontaneous synaptic remodeling may be one of them. We have very similar system. We again initialize it with three assemblies, but we put a connectivity matrix uh, into our model now. So before our excitatory neurons could couple to an all to all or couple all to all, but now the connectivity matrix tells which connections are allowed. So the connections in, in black are allowed, connections in white are prohibited. But the model is the same otherwise. And we pick such plasticity, oh, plasticity is the same, but we weaken it so that no neurons transfer from one well to another. So the plasticity is not strong enough to move the neurons. And now we start to change the connectivity matrix spontaneously. So we randomly flip the connection either on or off. And this noise introduces strong enough perturbations to move these neurons around stronger and also to move the neuron from one assembly into another. And you can see the, from the weight matrix that the weight matrix starts to remodel. Again, after around 30 hours, we see that the system has completely remodeled, but 
we can just reorder the neurons again and see that there are three assemblies, three memories that are intact, and memory one can still be recalled by activating its input neurons and read out by, active, by looking at activity of its output neurons. So to reiterate, we think what happens is um, assemblies are usually stable, and if you perturb the neuron, it will typically return to its assembly. If the perturbation is large, the neuron may leave its current and join some other assembly. There are two sources of noise. One is due to noisy activity when the neuron spikes together with another assembly, and one may be due to the spontaneous synaptic remodeling. Readout neurons and uh, input neurons experience less noise, so they always stay coupled to the assembly. It's also important to note that the switches, they happen fast relative to how long neurons stay in the assembly. Because if multiple neurons can leave the assembly, the assembly well, may just disappear and ev evaporate. So if you imagine like all the neurons that form the assembly start to transition to other assemblies, then yeah, the assembly will evaporate. And that's why the transitions have to be fast relative to how long neurons spend in the assembly. Or in other words, the changes must be slow. So neural representation will drift a neuron at a time or a few neurons at a time. And we think our model can explain some experimental findings. And we chose experiments by Denardo. Uh, they put mouse in some conditioned context. They played the a tone and gave a foot shock to the mouse sphere condition in it. And we model this system by an assembly in the prelimbic cortex that receives input from auditory cortex for the tone and input from the hippocampus for the context and outputs to amygdala that initiates freezing behavior. We used a simplified model that has the same drift and dynamics basically, but we need to simulate the plasticity that happens on order of milliseconds. And also we have to simulate it for weeks on, because drift happens yeah, over periods of weeks. So experiments were performed in the following way. On day zero, mice were here conditioned. On day one, day seven, or day 14, they went back to the cage for the first retrieval. And on day 28, they went for the second retrieval. Neurons that were active during the fear conditioning or first retrieval were labeled with TRAP2, and neurons that were active during the second retrieval were labeled with FOS. And they examined the overlap between representation on day 28 and earlier representations. So we want to know which neurons are still there. Here we plot, they plot overlap as a fraction of neurons in the representation on day 28. So overlap between representation on day 28 and day 14 is this number and overlap between representations on day 28 and day seven is a smaller fraction. And this happens because more time has passed since day seven to day 28 than since day 14 and day 28. So assembly had more um, time to drift and that's how we explain it. And for earlier days, the overlap is even less. So our model replicates this quite well and also explains why this happens. Our model also captures results of further experiments because neurons are labeled during the fear condition and first retrieval. You can photostimulate them at a later day and if representation has shifted, not all the labeled neurons here show in pink will participate uh, in the representation. So if you photoactivate the labeled neurons, you would expect less, less behavior shown or less influence on behavior the longer the time has passed since labeling because uh, assembly drifted even further and less of labeled neurons are in the representation. So for the first experiment, uh, they placed the mouse in a different context. So not where it 
had the fear conditioning and checked what happens with the laser off and with the photostimulation. So laser off is dashed line and basically mouse on day 28 showed very little freezing behavior if the laser is off. So it doesn't matter when neurons are labeled, mouse shows little freezing. Now, if you start to photoactivate the labeled neurons, then it depends, of course, on which day these neurons are labeled. So this is done on day 28. And if neurons were labeled on day 14, photostimulating neurons that were labeled on day 14 has more impact on the behavior than photostimulating neurons that were labeled on day seven. Again, because the representation has changed. Our model also captures this behavior. Next, they placed mouse in a conditioned context. And we just turned on the input from hippocampus that represents this condition in context. Again, we can photo activate the neurons or not. Here shown in dashed is without photo activation. Again, it does not matter for the behavior when the neurons were labeled because you are not activating them. And if one would start to photo activate the neurons, then the closer to experiment, the labeling was done, the more effect the photo activation will have on the behavior. And our model captures this. So we think that in the prelimbic cortex, there's a drifting assembly that represents this memory and yeah, gets input from the auditory cortex and hippocampus. If this um, experiment would be done for a longer time, uh, maybe it would be possible to observe complete remodeling. So here, there was some overlap still between assembly on day 28 and during fear conditioning. And our prediction would be if experiment would be continuing for a few weeks longer, then the overlap would go to chance level. To summarize, we propose that memories or some memories are made of drifting assemblies. They change. and they are stable because um, readout and input neurons are always connected at them, to, connected to the assemblies. And this is done with uh, unsupervised learning, so hidden plasticity. It doesn't require any re-experience of the event that caused this memory. And our model also explains why drift happens and it shows that spontaneous changes in synaptic strength can be one of the cause of the drift. And of course, yeah, we have some uh, experiments that we can explain. Yeah, for more information, as Tristan said, you can look at our preprints. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening. I would be happy to answer questions. Have we lost Tristan by any chance? <laughs> no, I'm still there. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, how should we go about it? I mean, people can maybe put it into the chat or just raise their hand. If there's any questions, Jochen has one. Yeah, first of all, congratulations. That was a fantastic talk. Very clear, beautifully done. Um, two thumbs up here. Now, I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them being now, so you start in your first simulations, but right? you start with three assemblies. Um, and I'm wondering, so what would be the conditions here? Or have you looked into this? Um, so in principle, right, when, when neurons can switch from one assembly to another. Um, what about the relative sizes of these assemblies? They seem to stay constant here, but couldn't there be an effect that maybe one assembly gets bigger and the bigger it gets, the more neurons it attracts? Why is nothing like this happening in the network? Is this due to the specifics of the homeostasis? Okay, yeah. So yeah, first of all, the size of course changes. Here we can see that assembly two has gained two neurons, but you are totally correct. On average, sizes remain the same. 
And this happens maybe easier to explain with this. If an assembly um, loses a neuron and becomes a bit smaller, then it has a, well, less neurons and less neurons need to um, activate. So in the smaller the assembly, the less neurons are required to activate it. So if assembly loses some neurons that it has higher chance to be activated or reactivated. So you would have more of reactivations and then more reactivations, more chances, this will, this reactivations will happen together with some spontaneous spike of another neuron. So more chances that one neuron will join the assembly. So actually, if you reduce the size of assembly slightly, it reactivates stronger. So you can think of the well, like imagine this neuron has left, maybe the well will become a bit deeper and it's easier for other neurons to fall into the well. So this mechanism helps to, to prevent this disappearance of assemblies. So who, I'm not sure I really understand mm -hmm. the intuition behind this completely. So a smaller assembly you say activates more frequently. Yes. I think this is already not perfectly clear to me why that needs to be the case. And then I would think that a smaller assembly might also then because there are fewer neurons active, it might exert, exert less pull on the neurons that are still outside and that it wants to bring in. So I guess it's really about various of the details of the nonlinearities in the system that make this work, or am I just not understanding this completely? So actually we have done it for quite different systems for leaf neurons would have this, uh... Yeah, STDP, we have binary neurons where we have uh, heavy plasticity and Poisson neurons with quite different plasticity. So we are sure it's not peculiarities of the system that uh, hold the assemblies together. And we have other models also that show the same behavior. Okay, why a smaller assembly has a higher chance to reactivate? Because let's imagine that it has lost this neuron now completely and it's no longer connected to it then we assume that the synapses between here would have more resources because they no longer need to make these connections. So the connections between the remaining neurons will be strengthened by a bit. Okay. And if you strengthen by a bit these connections, then less neurons are required to ignite the assembly. And that's why reactivations happen more frequently. Okay. Yeah, that, that, I, that I understand. But in the mm -hmm. beginning, you also said that there's a new work that suggests that these, this form of normalization isn't really necessary for this. That yes, uh, we think, conference. yes, we think it may not be necessary. I'm not sure how much I am allowed to review. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also has other mechanisms to prevent uh, disappearance of assemblies. Um, okay, I, maybe okay. you can attend the conference, that'll be. Okay, yeah. I, I'm awesome, I'll be looking forward to this. Um, I don't know how many other questions there are, but uh, if there's not a long line, I would be happy to ask another question, Christian. Go for it, yeah. I think there is uh, not a long line as far as I see now. Um, so what about the de novo creation of new assemblies? Mm -hmm. um, it seems that this would be rather tricky, maybe, because the existing assemblies are all eager to, to pull new ones, uh, new neurons, or, uh, but then maybe with what you just said about the small assemblies being quickly to activate. Um, yeah, what can you say about the formation of new assemblies in, in this network? So, first of all, we well, have to imagine that we have tried this with three assemblies because it's simple to illustrate and we have tried with more assemblies, five, two, ten. Uh, it works for any number we think. And if you now imagine that you have system that has many assemblies, if relative to assembly size, if each of these assemblies in the system will lose one neuron, it wouldn't affect the assembly if assembly has thousands of neurons, right? 
But if there are also many assemblies, if each assembly loses a few neurons, a new assembly may be formed from this. So we think that as you get well, larger systems, formation of assemblies will be easier. And we have also tested that we can create a new assembly by activating it some neurons from it will basically borrow some neurons from the other assemblies so i agree when we think of small systems may be difficult but we think with the larger systems it's easier because again to make a new assembly not so many neurons are required relative to the assembly size okay thank you and when the smaller assemblies have it somewhat easier to bring in uh, new neurons wouldn't that suggest that there should be some yeah default assembly size that is kind of preferred in the system yeah I, we yes we think so uh, there should be preferred size but i mean maybe then you will ask how can uh, how can then the new assembly be formed and I think it's still possible, but another answer may be that new assemblies don't have to be formed. I mean, we know that mm -hmm. assemblies arise already during development. There's experiments for zebrafish, for example. You have assemblies there from the very beginning before the sensory information starts to flow in. So maybe there are always this number of assemblies or like some relatively constant number of assemblies that are always ready to connect memories. It's just that they're not used for memories. Here, I mean, assembly can stay without being connected to input and output neurons. And I think it would be even easier if assemblies are already preset there. And then when novel learning is done, just some unused assembly is found and reconnected. Or if the, if the concept is related, then the used assembly can be, again, you know, repurposed and modified. So that's my answer. Cool. Thank you very much. Great talk again. Thanks. Anna, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Philippe, that was very cool. I loved all of those um, visualizations that I found very crisp and easy to follow. That was pretty cool. Um, my question is that you said that uh, you'd also try to introduce noise by randomly switching on and off synapses. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, did you do that independently of the synapse size, or did you prefer to remove synapses that are rather small and try to keep synapses that are large in the system? So we thought to make it easy and just independently of synapse size, introduce this remodeling. So when the synapse appears, it always has size zero, but when a synapse disappears, it's basically large and small synapse have equal chance to disappear just for simplicity. I mean, I think if we introduce um, size dependent modifications, I think this would also hold. But yeah, we. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I see there's a question by Samuel. Yes, thank you for the talk. So um, since you mentioned development, I was wondering, we, all, we know that we already have assemblies like super early development, right? For example, in visual cortex, even before eye opening. Um, and as far as I know, this actually already happens before there are any, any um, recurrent connections in the excitatory population. And to me, it seems like your model crucially depends on these recurrencies, right? Yes. Have you have you thought about these aspects, or is this, or do you rather think of this as a model of an adult cortex, for example? Yeah. Uh, well, I can answer in the following way. Maybe uh, if this assembly is formed without recurrent connections, uh, why are we sure that there are no like structure deeper that has recurrent connections that actually gives rise to these assemblies? that are in you know early visual cortex but yeah i would think we need for this particular model we need recurrent connections but at the same time the basic idea how the memory can be read out doesn't depend that much on recurrent connections it depends on correlated activity so if there are 
some other ways to ensure that the activity is correlated, then you can have a stable memory. But at the same time, early in development, maybe there are no memories and yeah, we don't need to think about it. Okay, thanks. I'm not sure if I answered the question. But... Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? Otherwise, I would uh, ask a couple. Um, so, do I get it right that if input or output cells would be silent for some time, that the assembly would lose basically context? Yes, if they would be yeah, completely silent, but we have another model. So here, the plasticity depends on spiking, but uh, we have another model where there are actually no reactivations, but uh, the plasticity doesn't depend. The neuron doesn't have to spike to well, increase its synaptic strength. Only slight change in voltage may be enough to induce plasticity. So in this model, we don't have to have this strong coincidence spike, and it just neurons from assembly must influence each other slightly. And this uh, correlated activity is enough already to keep the assembly together. So yeah, in this model, we need everything to basically spike sometimes, but we can easily imagine that plasticity doesn't require spiking, just requires a slight depolarization, and then it's already enough to keep uh, everything together. I can show if you want some slides. Yeah, go for it if you want to. So we use the different model where this, this is the, our standard leaf model. And you can see this is just correlation matrix that shows that um, there is correlated activity in the free assemblies. And here we show the events. Um, so the, how many neurons are active at some, in some time being as a fraction of the average assembly size. So you can see in our lift model, we have the strong reactivations where neurons need to spike to have these correlations and have this plasticity. I mean, there's some background spiking, but there are reactivations. And then we have a, a different model where we don't have these reactivations and that we use Poisson for this, that they don't generate these reactivations. And we have plasticity that doesn't require us um, to have two spikes for neurons to increase the synaptic strength. We have plasticity that just requires slight depolarization to increase synaptic strength. And in this model, you can see yeah, we have the correlations between the three assemblies and we have background activity, but there is no this uh, pronounced reactivation. So the spikes don't have to happen at the same time. So if you don't like that some neurons have to spike sometimes, then I would say that the plasticity may not have, doesn't have to have this exact form that we use and maybe some other plasticity that's okay to just you know, detect small changes in voltage. Okay, thank you. And um, another thing we were wondering that in our daily lives, we, we uh, frequently realize how demanding it can be to tune spike neural networks. So would you mind, uh, or if you want to, could you at least share a bit how, how this project started and how it developed over time and, and what the guiding principles were? Was it difficult for you as well to tune the network to be? <laughs> actually, it was, it's actually very surprisingly easy to do it. I mean, it's not done by tuning, uh, uh, like search and grid. It just, and basically, you know, the, let me show, you know, the parameters where the, maybe here, maybe where the assemblies are stable. And then you just increase the noise slightly. So increase the plasticity slightly. I mean, I got it on the third try, I think. Okay. Increase the plasticity slightly, there's change. And as I said, we have many different models, like binary model, Poisson model, and some other models where we make, we can make everything drift basically. I, I believe that if you, you give me some kind of model that's recurrently coupled, that is resistant to this kind of perturbations, then I can just increase noise slightly. And then, well, if you have a view of these wells, doesn't matter what these wells are. And these wells are stable 
relatively stable fixed point, then if I increase the noise, the correct level, you can start having switches between the swells. I think, yeah, it's not hard to make anything drift. Okay, thanks. Great. Unless there are any further questions, I think we can uh, end here. Thanks again, Philippe. I also uh, really liked the presentation. It was really clear and uh, appealing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.